Good evening and welcome to the Thursday edition of MCV News. I'm Glenn Wakai. All for today's sports fans, I'm Longshot Willie. Thanks for joining us tonight. Longshot will be back soon with a look at the day in sports and weather forecaster Vicky Tadella is still on vacation, but will be back very soon. But first, topping our news this evening. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. One senator feels if a handful of government employees are given a pay raise, everyone should see a similar increase. Before last night's Senate session was over, there was a lot of squawking in the chamber. What began as a very slow session really picked up steam as the evening moved along. After confirming three nominations, the senators took on a number of bills, one of which would establish a board to look into taking away water and sewage service from the Commonwealth Utilities Corporation. Senator Meritita's bill is expected to help the CUC become self-sufficient. Should this become law, we'll try to set a rate and, and try to, to make the, the water uh, self-generating uh, uh, revenue. So I will be conducting a public hearing on this, Mr. President. Senators unanimously passed the bill. Then the most memorable piece of legislation of the night went up for debate. It would increase judges' salaries by about $50,000. In a surprise move, Senator Juan Torres tried to tack on a comprehensive amendment. There shall be a salary increase of about 25% of across the board for all government of the CNMI employees and a call adjustment of 10% increase to all retirees in the retirement fund. If it is good for the judge to receive 60%, I think the other regular employees who make the backbone of this government deserve a break also, uh, Mr. President, and as well as uh, a call increase for all retirees. And, uh, and that's how I come about with the, the uh, percentage. To, to throw in a surprise amendment at this point is really just a monkey wrench being thrown in. And I will support Senator Torres if his effort is sincere. If he is really sincere, but if his effort is to, to block the passage of House Bill uh, 191, then I will not support his intent. Senator Torres wanted to respond to Manglotnia's comments, but other senators overruled and ended debate. Senators unanimously passed the bill, increasing judges' salaries. However, before the session adjourned, Torres was able to slip in his two cents. I'm not saying that the judges are not working hard. They deserve this race. But don't they deserve to be paid the same amount that they are getting? After those comments, Torres gathered his belongings and walked out. What he missed were more comments by senators. I believe the 25% is outrageous uh, in that, you know, uh, even the 14% the, the the that we passed, we had a long, uh, hard-fought battle there. 25% is, is not being, being uh, realistic. Senator David Singh fell short of saying Torres' amendment was an election year tactic and speculated on the public sentiment. The senators uh, are not good senators because they turned down the offer of uh, Senator Torres. But really, that is not the matter. The matter is, we are, we are in a financial crisis at this time. Senator Manglotnia suggested that Torres introduce his amendment as a separate bill. Meanwhile, House Speaker Tomas Villagomez is scheduling a session for tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. The fiscal 93 budget will be on the agenda. As of news time, the Speaker said the rest of the agenda was still being formulated. MCV News will be there tomorrow and will air the session in its entirety later, later this week. And it's deja vu in the courts. After a special prosecutor succeeded in banning the Attorney General from defending the CUC Executive Director, this morning, Attorney Dennis O'Shea again sought to disqualify Guerrero's counsel. Pamela Picardal has the details. After the Superior Court ruled in favor of government special prosecutor Dennis O'Shea's motion banning the Attorney General's Office's defense counsel to CUC Director Ray Guerrero on contempt of subpoena charges, O'Shea found himself back in court this morning, raising another motion opposing Guerrero's Guam private attorney, David Lujan. Well, Mr. Lujan is not admitted to the bar locally. He's a member of the Guam bar, but he's not a member of the Saipan or Commonwealth bar. Yes, that's the main thing that's happened today. That's correct. He's making application to practice, in this case, Pro Hoc Vici, 
which means limited only to this case. Lewin says three weeks from today, the courts will determine if he's qualified to represent Guerrero. And we will hear the uh, motion to have me allowed you know, to represent Mr. Uh, Guerrero on March 10th. And on that same date, the arraignment will also be heard. Meanwhile, O'Shea says the Supreme Court denied a motion for stay in appeal made by the AG's office. In other words, the Supreme Court will no longer intervene after upholding the lower court order that disqualifies the AG's office from defending Guerrero due to conflict of interest, since the Superior Court ruled that Guerrero is charged as an individual. Therefore, the AG's office cannot defend an individual against the CNMI government. However, several directors of various agencies expressed their concern when asked if they're intimidated by the contempt charges filed against Guerrero as an individual, not in his capacity as CUC director. Definitely. You know, uh, the age is supposed to protect me. Uh, you know, representing a government agency, you know, um, I shouldn't be personally uh, be charged of any, you know, contempt or any criminal act, uh, not unless, uh, of course, uh, did it personally. Public Safety Director Gregorio Camacho points out if he's accused for non-compliance of certain NMI laws in his official capacity, he asserts the AG should represent him. Camacho, however, asserted if he ever commits a felony, then that's the time he should seek the services of another counsel. As always, final decision will be laid by the courts. In Susupi, I'm Pamela Picardal, MCV News. Ray Guerrero isn't the only one facing a difficult situation. Plans for the expansion of the Saipan Harbor have been mired in problems since 1985. $27 million was, has attracted a lot of attention for the Commonwealth Ports Authority, not all desirable. For the first time, a rift is developing between board members. Tonight, we conclude our series on what's going on at the Commonwealth Ports Authority. It's been in the works for nearly eight years, the renovation and expansion of the Saipan Harbor. Eight companies from throughout the region were reaching for the Commonwealth's brass ring. It is the biggest contract ever awarded by the CNMI government. Secondly, because of the downturn in the economy, there are a lot of construction companies not only on Saipan, but throughout Asia and U.S. and the world, which are looking for projects. Korean-based Samsung was the winner for the Phase 1 contract. Competition is building quickly, and construction companies are finding it harder to keep busy these days. Because of that, there are more and more unhappy contractors. The CPA board is finding it harder to keep its name in a good light. The dust has not settled on a court and appeal brought by unsuccessful bidders. They're also prized by board members that Chairman J.M. Guerrero wields too much authority. We are very surprised about the... Uh about this infighting. It's just the two board members, Mr. De La Cruz and Mr. Sablon. Nick Sablon has been a harsh critic of the chairman. One of his allegations is that Guerrero benefited from the Samsung contract with two expensive Mercedes automobiles. The chairman and I were joking about that, and he told me to go and find those two new Mercedeses, and uh, I keep one, and he keeps the other one. Uh, no, there is no... Uh, uh, truth to, the, to the, that allegation. Rosario doesn't understand what Sablon is driving at. He says Sablon has no grounds for bad mouthing the board when he rarely attends meetings. Uh, it is very unfair for Mr. Sablon to be criticizing the board when he has not attended uh, board meetings for the past seven months. Rosario says construction of the Saipan Harbor expansion is proceeding as planned. A groundbreaking is scheduled for next Friday. And coming up next, high school students prepare themselves for life on Mars. We'll explain. And man's best friend helps in the war on drugs. Duty-free status for the Commonwealth is again in jeopardy. Virginia Congressman Louis Payne told resident representative Juan Bobalta that he will reintroduce legislation to correct what he feels are labor and wage rate problems in the NMI. According to a news release from Bobalta's office, Payne's bill would take away the duty-free status of goods made in the Commonwealth unless the labor force is paid the U.S. minimum wage of $4.25 per hour. Payne also wants half the labor force here to be comprised of local residents. 
The Virginia congressman represents a district where textile and garment manufacturing are vital to the local economy. On several occasions, he told NMI officials that he seeks a level playing field so the workers in his state can have an equal opportunity to compete for market share. During last year's congressional oversight hearing in Washington, D.C., Payne was the first to speak before the House Subcommittee on Insular and International Affairs. According to stats he obtained from the U.S. Department of Commerce and Labor, textile imports into the U.S. are at an all-time high. Payne says his, this translates into a loss of American jobs, 420,000 between 1980 and 1991, and 13,500 of those lost jobs were from his home state of Virginia. now employed in the textile and apparel and fiber industries, and the majority of these workers live in my congressional district. The economies of communities and individual families relying on good paying jobs cannot and should not withstand another pink slip day. As domestic industries face these bleak statistics, it is troublesome to see and read about the booming garment industry in Saipan. Washington resident representative Juan Bobalta has initiated a flow of information between the NMI government and Payne's office regarding what's being done to solve the NMI's labor and wage problems. Bobalta says he has kept Payne up to date on the status of the work being done by the CNMI's minimum wage task force. The bill has passed the House and is now with the Senate. Payne also told Bobalta that he was encouraged by the development, but, quote, more must be done, end quote. While the feds snoop around the Commonwealth, four-legged creatures will snoop around, your air, around the airport. Incoming luggage will be sniffed by trained dogs by, from the Division of Customs. Kelly Phillips reports that those trying to bring in illicit substances are barking up the wrong tree. The fight against drugs in the Marianas continues. And as Governor Guerrero put it in his speech this morning, there's good news and bad news. The good news is the canine teams at Customs are ready for action. The bad news is for those bringing ice into the Commonwealth. You're now more likely to get caught. In a ceremony this morning, the Customs canines and their handlers received certificates after completing a four-week training course together. Customs Chief Ed DeLeon Guerrero says the new canines are an added plus to the Customs Division. Uh, this is a, a very new technology, new method of assisting us in combating our drug problem. And uh, we, we take, as you know, the, the drug scenario very seriously. And uh, this is an added resource to our battle against substance abuse. The breed of the dogs is Malinois, and they come from the Netherlands. And with a nose that can tech 10,000 times better than the human nose, sniffing out drugs is just part of the job. They detect all the four basic um, drug odors, which is uh, marijuana, heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine. And uh, the, uh, of course, the, the weight has been on the marijuana and the methamphetamine because that's the biggest problem in your area here. After the ceremony, the canines demonstrated just the how they the find the drugs. The the drugs. <laughs> Are you the one that's carrying the drugs? Yeah. Okay, as you know, this Ben. Because Ben has been working with his dog for a month, he knows the reaction of the dog. After locating the box with the drugs, the dog sat in front of it. He is then rewarded by playing with PVC pipe. And just how much of a drug problem does the CNMI have? I think we have a significant drug problem, particularly with regards to ice. And this is the added element that we have on the, uh, on the drug is that we're detecting ice. Those arriving at the Saipan International Airport can expect to see the canine since they will also be nosing around the passenger arrival area to screen for drugs carried on the person. What it is, the, what they call the passive response, which these dogs are trained for, is where the dog does not do a, an aggressive response when he finds drugs. Instead, the dog shows it by sitting next to the location of the drugs. That way you can use the dog to search passengers, luggage, all these kind of things that, uh, that an aggressive response would not be appropriate for. On Capitol Hill, this is Kelly Phillips, MCB News. Those dogs wouldn't survive on Mars, but someday people may. Science students from the Marianas High School want to make others aware of what could happen if we continue to, to destroy the Earth by cutting down trees, using up our natural resources, and polluting our environment. Leila Camacho was at the Joten Kitsu Library today and talked to students about what it would take to live on another planet. Students from Marianas 
high school environmental science class came up with a special project called Marsville. They had to pretend they lived on Mars, which has a totally different environment from Earth. Students said Mars would be a good place to live because it's not polluted. Student Elaine Terlahi explained what it would take to live on Mars. This is all life would be living in Mars in habitats because Mars is totally different from Earth. There is no oxygen and no green trees to give us oxygen, so we're using our own system to make oxygen for us. Thank you. Okay. Than the Earth, and the effect is so extra light is needed for photosynthesis, and the solution is so we added a sun lamp to our greenhouse to make air, our heat from by geothermal. Thank you. Food supply system. Since Mars is 24 million miles further from the sun than the Earth, the effect is that so extra light is needed for photosynthesis, and the solution. We added a lamp to our greenhouse. And through geothermal, we can make heat, since Mars has a, has a lot of volcanic activities going on. Michelle de Mapan says the experiment should make people think twice about how they treat the environment. Today, we're just experimenting on how life would be on Mars. So we built these habitats to, and we also have systems inside where we explain how it works and how it affects us in where when we're li when we will be on Mars. The students were divided into seven groups and they had to design seven different habitats. Elaine helped design a volcanic one. The organizer of the experiment says that the students were enthusiastic space colonists. Since Mars is 24 million miles further from the sun than the earth, the effect is that so extra light in need for photosynthesis and the solution, we added a lamp to our greenhouse. Can make heat since Mars has a, has a lot of volcanic activities going on. The environmental science teachers and today we have put up the village Marsville. Uh, it's a cosmic village. Uh, it's a village that is sustainable. It doesn't harm. It doesn't harm the environment. The students have been working on this for the past three months, and today is the final link up of their actual village. How did you guys come up with this idea? Okay, this idea actually was not come up by us. This is a project from the Challenger Learning Center, which was a pro uh, an organization that was developed after the Challenger shuttle explosion. You have any other comments? Oh, I'm just really proud of the students. They're the ones that deserve all the praise. They're the ones who did all the hard work. And they're the ones that this should be focused upon today. This is Supi. This is Leila Camacho, MCV News. Ooh, a far out story. Back here on Earth, the Division of Environmental Quality advises the public not to swim or fish within 300 feet of the Central Repair Shop, the DPW Channel Bridge, and the drainage south of, south of the Hoffa Day Beach Hotel. High concentrations of fecal coliform bacteria in the water may be the result of runoff due to recent showers. And coming up next, we shower you with Longshot Willie, who says the Olympics will take on a tropical flavor this weekend, plus highlights of National Place of the Week. The Coconut Olympics are coming to Saipan. Ricochet Hot 98 FM radio personality and co-founder of the original Coconut Olympics has joined up with promoter Dan Bradley to bring this classic fun in the sun field event to the shores of Saipan. Here's Rick with more info. Um, we started the Coconut Olympics down on the beach in Tumon on Guam um, uh, with some friends that owned a, a bar. It was called Barney's. They were just opening up. Uh, uh, Barney Castro, Pam Lalonde, uh, wanted to do something sort of uh, different for their grand opening. We put it together, we came up with some crazy games, and uh, 
Next thing we know, we're doing it once a year, twice a year, three times a year. Why we are here is to invite everybody down Sunday to the beach right in front of the Hyatt at Skipper's uh, for uh, Ricochet's first Saipan Coconut Olympics. It's a uh, uh, wild and crazy beach games, a bikini contest. Miss Fiesta Nidzuk will be crowned Sunday, uh, which is queen of the coconut festival. Um, it's a, a hot fun in the sun, uh, beachwear competition, bikini contest. Uh, the winner, the winner will win two tickets to Honolulu, round trip tickets, you know, so they get to come back as well. <laughs> Some of the events will include uh, coconut trasherama, the coconut bag run, coconut tug of war, the three-legged race, um, and a lot of other, a lot of other wild and crazy games that are as much fun to watch as they are to play. So, um, uh, five dollar entry fee gets you into as many games as you'd like to participate in. You don't have to pay to come and watch. Rick has challenged me on some coconut events this Sunday. Sounds fun. Maybe I'll take him on. Once upon a time, I organized aerobic exercise on Saipan. consisted of low-key workouts around and in hotel pools, trying to improve body tone and pump some blood back into the weary system of island visitors. Wouldn't you know, the Japanese have made this an all into a competitive event, complete with famous fitness experts from Japan and wall-to-wall -wall coverage by the Japanese network TV Tokyo. The cameras will be recording the action as participants from Japan and Korea compete in beach walking, beach aerobics, aqua aerobics, and beach step aerobics. The competitive event gets underway Saturday, 9.30 in the morning at the Hyatt Regency Saipan Beach Site and finishes 6 p.m. Sunday. That's it for the Miller Sports Base. Stay tuned for the weather after this break. After a series of gloomy days, the skies finally smiled on us, revealing a bright sunny day. Let's move on to reveal what's in store over the next 24 hours. Tonight will be mostly cloudy with isolated light showers. Winds will be blowing from the east at 10 to 15 miles per hour. You can expect the temperature to dip into the mid-70s. Seas will be moderate to rough at 7 to 4 to 9 feet. Surf will be hazardous 7 to 10 feet on north, northern clockwise through th southeastern exposures. The sun will rise at 6.43 tomorrow morning, bringing in, bringing in a day of partly cloudy skies with isolated light showers. The high temperature is expected to reach the mid-80s. We're reaching the end of our newscast, but stick around. We'll be back after these messages. That's all the time we have for news tonight. That's right, Willie. In case you missed a portion of this cast, you can watch it again at 9 tonight tomorrow, and tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. On behalf of Willie, myself, and the entire MCV News team, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Cheers.